You have the camera there. Do you see me from uh, with the camera here? No. No. Okay, but I mean, if you insist on standing there, it's good not to have that uh, light in the eye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I will come here and talk to you uh, something about e-health or digital health today and also with uh, more focus on what is called pre-hospital care and I will tell you what this is all about. As Eric said, I will present myself and uh, we'll not go into any, all the details here but I started here at Chalmers many years ago with the ambition to work with biomedical engineering and that's what I've been doing all of my life. But that has taken me to... Uh, a lot of different work and different positions. So I've been an entrepreneur, innovator. I've worked in the, uh, companies and management of companies. And I've also done some research, etc., along the way. So I have been around in several different places and gathered a lot of experience and knowledge about that. But what I have always found very important, what, uh, what I have done, is to look at innovation and utilization of what I've been involved in which means that I have always tried to, even when I did research, make sure that this became beneficial for the patients or whoever it was de dealt with. So that has always been my ambition. Make sure that the things that you do make some difference for people. And uh, here are some examples of what I've been doing. I started off with more traditional biomedical engineering. For instance, my PhD was around uh, uh, looking at the lungs for pre-born infants and how well their lungs worked. And then I've been involved in different things like designing uh, ECG monitoring systems, more traditional. But very soon I came into this thing about using communication for various purposes, to send information from one place to another in order to support care, for instance, uh, at a distance. So we've done projects on the ferry boats going from Germany to Gothenburg using satellite communication. Uh, we also had on this East Indian man communication via satellite. So when it was in China, they could send information to Sahlgrensk if someone got injured or sick at the boat. Uh, this was one of the first systems where we worked with very early mobile telephones. You can see them here uh, for monitoring small babies with uh, problems with their uh, breathing in their own homes so that they could take them out from the hospital and make them stay in the home. Uh, we did design systems for taking care of big accidents, so there was a lot of communication on the feed to find out where do we have the injured people, what type of injuries do they have, and also send this information to those that planned the whole rescue uh, there. Uh, we started to look at various systems for monitoring people with chronic diseases in their own homes. So this is a prototype of some kind of home terminal which could be connected to a hospital. So if this pa patient, for instance, who had uh, congestive heart failure or chronic heart failure could be monitored from a distance. And this f ended up in this type of solution, which I will talk a little bit more about. We've been involved in what is called smart homes and some other stuff. And this is what I'm doing right now. Uh, I'm running an open collaboration arena for pre-hospital ICT which I will tell you a little bit more about. And I'm working here at Chalmers part-time, and I'm involved in different type of boards, advisor boards, company boards, etc. But everything has to do with biomedical engineering and digital health. This is maybe what brought me really into this world of e-health or digital health, and it was that I was part of designing a concept for sending ECG and other information from an ambulance to a hospital in order to take care of like biocardial infarction patients, etc., in a more efficient way. And this started in 1986 with the first tests. And I will also tell you a little bit more about that later on. But this brought me into, let's say, telemedicine, e-health, uh, and also like how do we make business out of this. So what I will tell you about today is first tell you what is really e-health and digital health. Because I can tell you already now that communication is an essential part of this. And that is communication in many various aspects, mobile communication uh, and other types of communication and how to use that. Also give you some of the background for why is it so, has it become so important with e-health and digital health right now. Well, it's been around for several years, but it's constantly growing the interest for this part. 
And I will talk a little bit about pre-hospital e-health and digital health and give you some examples on what we are doing within that area and how communication becomes part of that. So, what is it? Any of you have any idea? Not? Okay. I think this is the simple definition. It's the use of information and communication technology to improve care and promote health and well-being. And that could mean, for instance, that we have uh, like electronic patient record, picture and archiving systems for x-rays and stuff like that. <coughs> it could also be different types of support to decision making, uh, using computerized clinical decision support. And this also includes uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning today, to a very large extent. Uh, also different ways to bring care closer to the patients, for instance, monitoring people at home if they have chronic diseases and stuff like that. Also very much about improving care processes so that different parts of the healthcare sector can hook into each other in a nice way to take care of the patient. For instance, if we have a myocardial infarction or stroke, which I will tell you a little bit more about later on. And here are a lot of issues around, for instance, interoperability between different types of systems so that we really can support the care processes. And I can almost say that this is what I'm focusing most on now is to improve different types of care processes because it, there is so much to do there. And then we have all this thing about M health or mobile health and these things about apps and your doctor on the net and things like that. All this is part of e-health or digital health. There are of course different definitions around. This is what the WHO says. But they again end up in this thing, it's the use of information and communication technologies for health and have some different type of examples here, I will not go into the details. This is another way to describe the whole thing and you can see there are a lot of different parts of what is called e-health. And all these are very interesting by themselves. So here we have some old things like teleradiology and telepathology. For instance, teleradiology is about sending x-rays long distances. For instance, here in Sweden, we have the backup for looking at x-rays, sometimes in, in Madrid, in Spain, or even Australia, because they have problems supporting with the x-ray doctors in those areas, like in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, we have very different kinds of telemonitoring. I told you a little bit about M health. We have this thing about ambient assisted living that is supporting with various ICT tools in to make your living easier. For instance, if you're elderly or you have some kind of handicap. So there are a lot, and then we come on to more like system solutions, clinical information systems, etc. So there is a lot of different words around, but e-health and digital health is all about this. And uh, digital health has become very popular to talk about, I would say, the last three to five years. Before that, everyone talked about e-health. But digital health covers all these various topics, as you see here, healthcare IT, health ICT, etc., etc. But again, there is no straight definition what this is. You can say as soon as you use something like ICT to promote health and whatever, it becomes digital health. And another thing that is very much around now, as in many other aspects in the society, is the digitization and the digitization of healthcare. And there is a lot of discussion around that, that we must make use in a better way of all those digital tools that we are developing to improve the efficiency in the healthcare. For instance, to make it easier to book an appointment or reschedule your appointment or to get information on diseases like the one we have right now going on with this uh, coronal, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, virus. And there, so you, if you go out on the internet, you will see that there are a lot of articles and discussions around this. How do we really make this happen in a good way? So the next question then is, is there any specific e-health technology? So what do you think about that? Maybe I would say, I'm not sure, but of course things like interoperability standards for having those systems talk to each other or terminology standards so that one system understands the other so that left arm doesn't become right arm in the other systems if they exchange information. 
and some types of security solutions. But in general, I would say that this is just standard technology. Whatever you learn here could be tools that you could use to do e-health solution. But the important thing is the context. And that also comes when it is about communication aspects. It is the context that tells us what shall we do and why. And this also means that any of those tools that you see around today can be used for e-health applications. It's merely, again, the context. And what do I mean by that? Well, we need to understand, for instance, what is the care or the medical needs that we shall support and handle with this solution we set up so that we choose the right technical tools to really fulfill what those customers, so to speak, are looking for. We also have to look very much to the users of these systems, like what if we have something at an el elderly patient's home and we have something in the hospital, we must make sure that this works together and that both can handle this system. Uh, for instance, I, I like to say this, that one saying that goes around very often is that, well, in the future there will be no problem because all the elderly people will, uh, will know how to use internet and they are so used to use smartphones, etc. I say that that is ridiculous to say because when we get older, we see less good, we have tremor and we have other problems and sometimes you also check out from the technologi technological development. So you don't know about the latest things within smartphones, etc. So you always have to have in mind when you design something for, for elderly people that they have this kind of problems that they cannot do what I can do. And that sometimes people very often tend to, to miss because they are saying more sophisticated technology will solve everything. That is not too true. The problem today is not that we don't have technology enough. The problem is that we don't really find out how to use it in a good way. We can do a lot with all the technology we already have. Another thing that becomes very important when dealing with healthcare is legislation in various sorts. It's all of these things about integrity and, and things like that and security, but it's also that they have to be tested. All equipment has to be tested in particular ways so that they are safe to use. And this also goes, for instance, for medical software. They are also what is called medical products. It's the intended use that governs this. You have ethical consideration and things like the technology uh, availability. And we talked a little bit about that, Eric and uh, I, before I started here, that in many of those situations where I've been around and, and we have worked with mobile communication, our biggest problem are usually around the coverage, for instance and the reliability of the communication systems. And uh, I have a favorite saying when it comes to mobile communication that the only thing you can be sure of is that it goes down. And you must be, and they always have to have that in mind because you always have to design your solution so that you can handle the situation if the communication drops. Make sure that it uh, connects automatically when it comes back or have a fallback plan to do when it doesn't work so that the people, for instance, in an ambulance don't get totally handicapped because the uh, communication doesn't work. They always have to have a plan B or even a plan C to do. So this is one of the most important things I have to say is always remember that communication will go down, but be prepared for that and decide what to do. And then you have other things like costs, etc. So, something about the drivers for this. Why is it so interesting to use a lot of in information technology and why have like, digital health become so important? Many years ago now, I think this was around the year 2000, there was a study carried out in the United States that said that something between 44 and 98,000 people died in the healthcare sector due to mistreatment every year. Now it has grown. And one of the biggest reasons for this was that they were lacking important information when they should uh, take care of a patient. And then, of course, information. Well, that's about the information and communication technology. Can we make sure that we have reliable information available all the time we shall treat the patient? Then we can do better. And they did similar studies in, in other countries. This is one is from Sweden. I've translated some of it. But here they found that there were some 3,000 deaths per year 
caused by mistreatment in the healthcare sector. So these people, if they had been treated correct, wouldn't have died. <laughs> and I think that this is very interesting because I usually compare it with the traffic safety. Uh, and in the traffic, there is around 300 people. Uh, now this year, th last year I think it was 250 or something that died. And if you look at the cause, you can say that half of these people approximately are in cause. And of those that are in the cause, there are about 40% that doesn't use their safety belt. So we can make a rather big improvement just putting on our safety belt in the cars. But compare this with 3,000 a year that dies due to mistakes in the healthcare sector. Maybe we should have some kind of zero vision for what we do in the hospitals, etc. as well. Another thing that really drives this is that the population, they sometimes told the, they call it the age quake. There are more and more elderly people. And those people that live longer, they also have more and more different diseases. They are called multi-disease patients, and they cost a lot. So that is the biggest cost. Sometimes I think they say that 80% of our healthcare costs is uh, used during our last 20% of our life. I think some even say it's less than maybe 10% of our life. So there is something to do there. And another problem is that you can skip those slides. Another problem is that there will be less people taking care of those elderly because those that should pay for the health care becomes fewer. So we need to find a way to be more efficient in how we provide health care. And this thing about digitalization, etc., is one part of this that we must find other ways to become more efficient and treat patients in another way if we should cope up and deliver a good health care. And uh, for instance, here in Sweden and in many other countries, there is now a tendency to what they call here in Sweden, it's called good and close care. That is that they bring out more and more health care into the patient's home. Even if you're pretty sick, you can be treated at home. There are mobile teams that uh, goes around and supports when something happens. In, so, and that um, it means that there will be less beds available at the hospital because those patients are in their own homes. What is also happening at the same time is that we move, we specialize and centralize some different types of care that should be done in particular places in order to get a qual good quality. So in the end this means that there will be more and more mobile health care and health care in people's home. And again, if this shall work, we need to have good and working communication. So there is a big challenge in order to support this transformation we already have started. In Stockholm, they say that they have started that already when they take pi people away from New York Karolinska. But the problem is that they haven't been provided it in the primary care yet. But uh, this process is already ongoing. And uh, of course, this is just not in Sweden or other Western European countries, so to speak, that this is happening. This is something that happens all over the world. And this is from WHO, and they say that almost 60% of all states within WHO have strategies for e-health in, in their uh, countries. And here they have even designed national e-health strategies, some kind of guidance to how to build up national e-health guidance. And if we look at Sweden, we have been around with this since like 15 or almost 20 years ago, at least 15 years. And the, the idea we have here in Sweden is that we shall support three different aspects here. We shall empower the patient, so give them more access to their own uh, e-health data, for instance, in, in the electronic records, have more support in their homes. We should support policy makers by having good material to make decisions on which treatments we shall prioritize, etc., see at the outcomes of what we have been doing. We should also support the health professionals, like having clinical decision support systems to make better diagnosis and whatever. But we also need to look at the infrastructure. And here are different parts of infrastructure. For instance, we have the laws and regulations. Today we have laws and regulations stopping us from sharing information, for instance, between different care providers. We need to get rid of that if we shall have an efficient uh, information exchange. And we also need to look at the information and technical infrastructure. And all these processes have started, but I to say it goes quickly, that would be to lie a lot. 
this is going very slow, but we are still moving. And uh, this is the latest uh, version, I think, from 2016, that we have a vision for eHealth 2025. And there it says that we shall be the best in the world. I don't know how they should measure this, but yes, that is the ambition, that we should be best in the world on eHealth. If you look into this document, I think that there is three words that it is interesting to see, that they use e-health in this way that WHO recommends. They also discuss about the importance of the digitization process. And they also talk about welfare technology. And welfare technology is also like a very close relative to what digital health is, because this is really different types of technology to help elderly in their homes to have a better life, or people with different types of handicaps. So this is also something that is very interesting. And I think that, that what we shall be best, I think this is important, to make it easier for people to achieve good and equal health and welfare. Very much what we are doing is about equal uh, health and welfare. And this is a real challenge as well, because we have a country where not every person lives in a big city. So if we should be able to deliver equal care, if something happens in the northern parts of Sweden or even in 20 uh, 20, 200 kilometers from Gothenburg, <laughs> they should have a chance to have the best possible care there. And this is something that we are looking into, I will tell you a little bit later about that, but how do we achieve equal care in a country like that looks like this? This is not genus perspective, it's like individuals should have the right to have the best care no matter where they live or where they are. This is a tough thing, but again, it becomes communication because you can set up like small hospital satellites out in the rural parts and have communication with the bigger hospitals so that people don't have to travel long distance to do a follow-up or a first check. So there again is very much about communication. Very important thing also within eHealth is the electronic patient record or electronic health record. And there is a lot of saying, and this has gone around for a long time, that one patient should have one record. And I mean that this is not the sense that that should be one record in one particular computer, for instance. They, they, what this is all about is that relevant information on you should be available wherever you enter the healthcare sector. If you go to the primary care, if you do it in Gothenburg, if you do it in Stockholm, if you do it in Åre, no matter where you are, all your information should be available there so that they quick can get an access and understand what has happened. And unfortunately, this is not yet the case. But again, if we shall be able to do this, things like, for instance, standardization and how you deal and exchange information is very important. And there are some different types of standards growing up now that I is very important for that. For instance, SNOMED CT is about terminology. HL7 is about more technical, how do you change information, etc. I don't expect you to, to know all about this, but it is important that you know that there are some good standards to know about. DICOM is about exchange of images, for instance. And I usually say that this is what that is all about, and what we are trying to achieve. If we shall be able to put together a long train, we must make sure that we agree on the track with and how the wagons couple together. And unfortunately, we are not there yet. And uh, sometimes we haven't even put out the rails yet. So there is a long way to go. And I think that this is also very important to remember when this hype about artificial intelligence is uh, around. Because one of the biggest problems we have there, if we exclude images, is that we don't have the data. Because we haven't constructed our system so that we have access to good and reliable data to put into these algorithms. So we have to start here. We must make sure that everything we do is stored in a way so that we can reuse it to build better uh, decision support systems. Another problem we have is that there is low adherence to treatment. So people get, for instance, prescriptions on medicine and they don't take it. And one thing is to be able to follow this up in people's homes, for instance, to make sure that they take them. 
and then we have this type of solution. This is a no project I was involved in, but in principle we do the same thing, yes, so that we hook up the patients over the internet so that caregiver and other can follow up what has been doing. And we can also add different type of uh, measuring systems using, for instance, Bluetooth or whatever to communicate with some kind of gateway and out on the internet. So this is like a general vision what that could look like. We also see this as one of Eric's favorite teams, uh, like body area networks. There are a lot of different equipment coming around now that we can use to monitor blood pressure, the pulse and whatever, and they could use networks that are just like around the body and they communicate somewhere else. And here are other examples, for instance, we can use more textiles to get information from the heart, the breathing or whatever. Uh, Google worked with this, I don't know what happened with that, but that was a glucose link, to so monitor glucose to help supporting people with diabetics and have a constant monitoring of that. Uh, here are other things that are part medical, part health, part well-being, etc. All this kind of stuff can be part of monitoring people at a distance. And there are, of course, a lot of apps around. But here is the tricky part, and this is something I want to give you this information about. You have to decide what is this app about? Is it supporting fitness, well-being? health promotion or tracking, or care and medical support. That is very important to know, because the further you go down here, the more it looks like a medical device, the trickier it will be to bring it out, because then there will be regulations governing what you can do, and what you can say that it can do. And uh, therefore there is something called software as a medical device, which in fact tells you that whatever you bring out as a software, and this also includes like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, they have to be tested uh, just as if they were a medical device, that they are secure, that they do what they say that they do, and things like that. Then we have these things that you probably come around, all those doctors on the internet, uh, this is one of the most famous one internationally, it's called ba Bablon, it's a uh, UK product, and that is also part of what is digital health and e-health. And then we have this with artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of uh, that around right now, and a lot of hopes to this, and uh, being around for a while I say, well, this will change things, but not maybe in exactly the way that they say. But of course, it's a very important tool that we are getting in our hands. But there are some tricky things with it. And this is one of my favorites, because if you look into this type of technology, I like to use three different things to look at. It's the data part, it's the algorithms, and it is to bring it out in the healthcare sector. And this is generally how people pay attention to this. But I would say that the challenge and the effort is in this way. You have to put a lot of effort in this part and this part. This is just time and money. But these are the tricky things to handle. I think I skipped this one. Time runs out. But uh, this is some important thing, that you need to have results with known performance and precision when you design an algorithm. And you have to verify that, but for instance, by doing clinical studies, etc. You cannot put something out on the market without having done the clinical homework on this. And this is so important that a lot of people miss this. There is one example out now, for instance, in, in the Stockholm region, where they had used, designed their own machine learning system for looking at x-rays. And then they started to use it on patients without having done these things. So now they are uh, up for investigation, what they have really done, and they might have to stop this, because they haven't followed the rules. So this is very important to remember. Okay, pre-hospital e-health. This is what I've spent most of my time with right now. So what is pre-hospital e-health? Well, it deals with things that you do outside the hospital. That's why it's called pre-hospital. And when we study this, we look very much at the processes and we start with something like an incident. Something happens outside. It could be someone calls that uh, I have a sick person here. 
It could even be that the car launches an e-call today automatically when the airbag has st uh, blown up. And it could be things that happen on ships, in the mountains or wherever. These are things that happen outside. And what we are doing then is that looking at the complete process from when the incident occurred until, uh, till it's handled by, for instance, the dispatch, so you call 112 or an alert central, what are they doing and what can we do to improve how they select resources and things like that and make decisions on what to send out. And when you have, for instance, an ambulance on site, then we look at the whole process to where you leave the patient. And that is not always in hospital. More and more it becomes that they leave the patient at home. <coughs> and if we shall be able to support this process in a good way, we need to have common efficient information exchange <coughs> all along this chain. Again, communication and information handling. And make sure that in every instance here, we have the right information available <coughs> to make the best decision. So, <coughs> we talk a lot about increased decision precision. And if we do that, we can go for a vision where we say no mistakes in patient assessment and prioritizing. And there are decisions all the way here. And these are some figures, again, remember those 300 in the course. If we look at the most acute pre-hospital care patients we have, we can say that in Sweden we have, for instance, 25,000 new cases a year of stroke, with a mortality of 20%. We have approximately the same amount of individuals getting acute myocardial infarction. And there is some 25% mortality. We have the, the silent killer, which is called sepsis, the blood poison in the old days. 40,000 new cases a year with a mortality of 20%. And we have a lot of people that rise uh, due to trauma, and that's not only car accidents, it's people falling and whatever. So altogether here we have more than 100,000 new cases a year with a mortality between 20 and 25,000. And all those people, approximately 60 to 75%, have their first contact with the healthcare sector in the pre-hospital environment. So if we can do things here to support that they are treated in a better way, we can do significant differences when taking care of those patients. And that's why we have focused on this area. And in all those cases, time is very essential, that you need to find get to the right treatment as quick as possible without getting any unnecessary delays. So it's about improving the care chains from when the call is launched, the incident is detected, until we have the patient at the right side. And uh, I will go into some of the examples of things what we are doing. And I will start way back when, in uh, 1986. When a few of us guys here got an idea, why don't we use this thing called Mobitex, which was a mo new mobile communication system at that time, to improve how we take care of people in ambulances. And this all ended up in a product called Mobimed. And uh, these were the young and handsome guys. Uh, well, they are not young anymore. Uh, and uh, what that was all about was uh, transmitting information from the ambulance and make sure that we could provide enough information for those that were at the hospital to support the people doing the work in the ambulance, but also prepare for the patient coming to the hospital and also having information for follow-up so that we after could see how well did we do, should we pro change the process a little bit. And this system is still around. I'm not involved in the development anymore. I left the company in 2012. But, uh, they are still around and today they are, well, some 2,000 ambulances around uh, Europe running their systems. And in the UK I think there is somewhere between 12 and 1,500 ambulances using this system right now. And uh, this system was very much, although that wasn't our intention from the very beginning, but it became very focused in the first years on myocardial infarction. And why was that? Well, if you get an acute myocardial infarction, we, you, you need to get rid of the cloth or, uh, in the coronary arteries as, qu as quick as possible. And in principle, there are two ways to do this. You can either get a dis uh, clot-dissolving drug that takes it away, 
or you can do what is usually called a PCI, that is that you mechanically go in with a catheter and withdraw the cloth that is uh, hindering the blood from flowing. The important thing in the ambulance is to decide, first, do we have a myocardial infarction and what is the best treatment for this patient? And what we can do then by transmitting ECG and other information is that we can decide, okay, this is the best treatment for this patient depending on where he or she is and what resources we have available for this ambulance to get. For instance, if they should make in PCI, not every hospital can do that. So then they need to make a decision on the road, okay, this is a PCA candidate, let's go to that hospital. If they should do thrombolysis, well, they can even do that in the ambulance. But if they start that, it's not so easy to do a BCI because then the patient can start bleeding very much. So this is a tricky thing to make the right decisions. And what this whole thing is about then is to provide the best information to make an informed consent on what shall we do with this patient. And as you see, this is an old slide from where I was working with this system, but you can see a lot of different types of communication involved. We had a tablet or a rugged tablet here, which used Bluetooth to a measuring unit. And this unit then was connected using very many different communication systems to some kind of server somewhere, where we hooked up various hospitals. And here was a lot of communication to servers, etc., etc., and into other types of systems. But we need to be able to handle all those types of various communications. Sometimes we could also switch here. We had a very interesting test installation in Wales where we switched between uh, 3G and satellite because they had so bad coverage. So when they lost the 3G coverage, we went over to satellite and when we got back 3G, we switched back again because it was so expensive to use satellite. So again, you need to think of what you should do with the communication and what is the essential thing to do. And just to show you, does this type of system have any effect? Well, this was a study we did uh, down in Germany at a place where we compared in a larger area, like uh, there were some four or five hundred thousand people living there. And we compared if they took care of their myocardial function in the old way and if they used our system, which reduced the time from where you met up with the patient until you had them on the table and could make a PCI. And we shortened that period with about 30 minutes. And when we looked at those, we could see that if they didn't use our system, they had a mortality, a 30 day mortality rate of 14.6%. And with our solution, they were about 5%. That big difference just sparing, say, 30 minutes in average. And the reason for this is that in the beginning, you lose a lot of living heart tissue very quickly. So the farther, closer we can get to the start of this incident, the better. The more heart tissue we can save, the better the outcome for the patient. And in this region, I made a rough calculation. I could say that if they changed to our system, they could save 65 people a year for their lives. Uh, now, ending up with what we are doing at Lindholm and Science Park. There I have started something. Uh, the work started some in times in 2011, 2012. Based on my experience, I said, we cannot continue working like this because it goes too slowly to get the nice ICT solutions out to help patients. So we need to find another way of cooperating between academia, companies, and the healthcare sector. So we started this, what is a so-called open innovation platform, where all those meet, where we try to identify the problems, we run projects to show what we can do, and we spread a lot of information around uh, ICT in the pre-hospital sector. And so, well, this is where we are at Lindholmen, and here is something about what we do, but we skip that now. Uh, here are some examples of the projects we are running, and I will go into two of them before I end. The first project we started was something called pre hospit This was about the semantic and technical interoperability. So I brought together 21 parties from all over Sweden to say, OK, if we really can show that we can do this in practice using standards, can we really improve the care chain? And we proved that in uh, simulations. VIPS is video support and pre-hosted stroke chain. I will talk a little bit more about that. But there are a number of different types of projects we are running. 
And uh, the first one I will tell you about is the video support in the pre-hospital stroke chain. All this came around that we had looked into the care chain from call to end for a typical stroke patient in, in this region. And we had looked at uh, where, where different types of information was important. And we found that if we in could introduce video conferencing from the ambulance to the stroke experts at the, the hospital, we could improve the care process significantly because we could take people that needed a particular type of treatment directly to, in this case, Sorgenska Hospital to get this particular treatment, which they couldn't get at any of the smaller hospitals in the region. We also found that we could introduce video conferencing in other places from the patient's home, for instance, also from the caller to the dispatch center. But today we are mainly focusing on this part. And again, as with our myocardial infarction patients, there are the same type of treatments available for stroke patients. Either you give this uh, thrombolytic treatment, the drug, or you mechanically go up into the brain and pull out the plug that sits there and hinders the blood from flowing. And this type of treatment can only be done at like university hospitals like here at Sorgrenska. But this treatment is so fantastic because you can have a patient that almost walks out of the table after they have had this uh, treatment. It is so effective. The thing is to, is to find those patients that are best treated in this way. Because if we should take them, I will show you on the map here. So this is where we in this region can provide thrombolysis. This is thrombectomy. So think if we have a patient here. Where shall we take this patient? Shall we take them to Sahlgrenska? Or shall we take them to one of the closer hospitals? Because if they shall have thrombolytics, we can go there. But if we go there first and then go to Sahlgrenska, then we are losing time. So the thing is to make a decision already here. Where shall we take the patient? And, uh, or even call for a helicopter, for instance, uh, because time is so critical. So what we have done now is that we use video conferencing to have a stroke expert do an examination from a distance at this patient. And based on that examination, together with the ambulance personnel, they make a decision on where is the best place to take this patient. And we have then tested with various uh, cameras, for instance. Now we have three cameras in this car, ambulance, uh, looking at uh, the pupils, for instance, and the face. And we have a fisheye and we have a side view. And uh, today we are running three ambulances, uh, test ambulances, uh, out in these regions, Ulrichshamn and Schiene, uh, where we have run them now since April last year. And now we are on a way to uh, introduce 12 ambulances in this region. So we are right now in the process of equipping them to get more clinical data. And finally, this one is the one I will talk about. We have also a project where we have introdu introduced a pre-hospital test bed. That is that we have now a complete ambulance here at the Sorgenska University Hospital, which we equip with various types of communication equipment, video consultation and things like that, so that we can do full-scale simulations of various types of processes. If we introduce a new type of clinical decision support, we can test it, because we have, for instance, cameras that we can monitor what people are doing, how they're interfering with the equipment. We will have access to, let's call it fake patient journals, so we can bring them up or also in, uh, distribute. So that will become part of the new IT solution that this region is introducing. And we have two various uh, video co uh, communication systems, the old one and this new one that is part of the infrastructure of Estra Jutaland. So this will become very, very interesting for us to use. So this is really the infrastructure here. We have the Cisco solution with the router uh, and a codec in the ambulance communicating with the whole infrastructure of uh, Västra Götaland. And we can add different types of applications here. And then we also have in parallel our own uh, communication systems. Here we can do whatever we like <laughs> uh, and set up new test application, etc. And the thing is that we should use this for research. Uh, the region here we use it when they are testing new equipment. And we can also bring in companies that want to test new products in this area. And one of the reasons why this is important is that it's very tricky to do research and evaluation in 
real operating ambulances for various reasons. One reason is that it takes a long time to get the right uh, patients on board. It's also very difficult to do research on patients because if they are really ill, you cannot get consent on uh, doing measurements on them. <laughs> and there is also very difficult to put up test application in parallel with the operational equipment they already have. So this helps us a lot. When we have done these tests, it's much easier to go out in the real world. And now we can even bring this ambulance out in the real world because it's a standard ambulance they have here in this region. Okay, I'll stop there. There are more examples, but uh, I decided to go through a few of them. So if you're interested, you're very welcome with questions, etc. And you can look at our website. We have a lot of fun, interesting projects running there. And we are also, when you're at that stage, interesting in having master thesis. So thank you. Okay. Yep.